let's move on to talk about this particular study. Um, I'm going to put this study in context, uh, but to give you a lot of fair amount of detail about the EPPE study, EPI as we say. Um, there's a lot more I could say, but I don't have time to, but uh, from our website and from our publications, you'll be able to download all the further details should you require them. Okay, first of all, let's think about the context in which early years provision happens. The culture and social context, a sort of macro level, which would include such things as the labor market policies and practices in a country, the ideology in a country, will lead to particular policies in early childhood, such as the provision of childcare or early childhood education. Um, that in turn will lead to particular patterns of family support, particular patterns of childcare, particular early childhood education centers, which in turn affect the children's daily experiences at the individual level, both in the home and out of the home. And it's those daily experiences which are the primary drivers of the child's actual development. Okay. Now, why should we focus on the early years? Well, there has, over several decades now, been accumulating more and more evidence that what happens in the early years really does matter in the long term. For example, Gosta Esping Anderson, a Danish social scientist, is quoted uh, as saying, if the, if the race is already halfway run, even before children begin school, then we clearly need to ha examine what happens in the earliest years. And Fraser Mustard, uh, a quote from one of his talks, the first 2,000 days are the most important. The experience we are exposed to in early life affect equity in health, learning, and behavior throughout life. And I can give you other quotes from other people who've done similar kinds of reviews, all pointing in the same direction. Now, why is that? Well, it's because, to a large extent, we find that there's lots of evidence uh, linking early risk factors to poor on outcomes later in life, such as poor literacy and numeracy, school failure, unemployment, antisocial behavior and criminality, substance abuse, mental health problems, and physical health problems. Um, but when we consider the families at risk, as it were, of these early, uh, envir uh, early environment problems, we want to think about a kind of pyramid of risk. At the bottom here, we have the ordinary population where children are safe and well in well-functioning families. Then above those, we have families where there isn't outright immediate risk, but the children are potentially vulnerable. Then we have some, indi some initial indications of risk. Then more risk to such an extent there's clearly risk of significant harm. And then at the very top, we have the risk is so overwhelming and transparent, the state actually intervenes to do something about the child and the child's environment. So there are varying levels of this risk pyramid. And the kinds of factors we're talking about will operate in different ways for families and children at different levels of this pyramid. For many families, their problems derive from problems with the infrastructure of society. And no amount of counseling, early childhood curricula, or home visits will take the place of jobs with decent incomes, affordable decent housing, good health care, optimal family structure, and supportive neighborhoods where children encounter positive role, mo role models and families get positive support. So we, we can't ignore those uh, bigger societal problems when we're considering the uh, impact of early childhood education and care as we're doing in the EPI study and other early environment factors. Now, when we look at early environment, uh, we sometimes look at it as a basis for an intervention with disadvantaged groups. And interventions essentially adopt a strategy. If people keep falling off a cliff, don't worry about where you put the ambulance at the bottom. Build a fence at the top and stop them falling off in the first place. You know, prevention rather than uh, rescuing them after the event, as it were. And 
Uh, one example of a study of this kind is the well-known Perry Preschool Project, which, are, which is a randomized controlled trial of 123 African-American children in extreme poverty in Ypsilanti near Detroit. And the intervention was a program of high quality, high scope preschool classes from age three um, with planned learning activities and also weekly home visits. And the program group did got whatever happened to be available uh, otherwise. And these children were studied initially in the 60s and they're now well into their 50s. And we've got very long-term data on these children, uh, and now adults, of course. And we see that when they're 27 and 40, the earnings of the program group in red is clearly greater than the no program group. Employment is better. Owning your own home is better. Owning, owning your own car is more likely. Having a savings account is more likely. So on all those economic indicators, the people who had this early childhood education in those uh, early years, three to six, clearly did better uh, than the, ch the children who didn't have that experience. And when we look at the non-economic outcomes, like discipline problems, the likelihood of being arrested, either at 27 or at 40, the likelihood of violent crime, the likelihood of drug crime, all are better in the program group than the no program group. So on economic and social and other indicators, the program group here are doing much, much better, which clearly indicates the potential preventative influence of early childhood education for later cognitive, educational, economic, and social outcomes. Okay. And in that Perry Preschool project, at age 21, the cost of the program was only $12,000, but the benefits were over $88,000. So that gives us seven to one return on investment. By age 40, that return on investment had increased to 15 to one. Now that's, I quote this study because it's by far the most famous study in this area. It's not necessarily the best study or the most convincing in many ways, but it is the one most commonly cited, primarily because it's a randomized controlled trial and is one of the earliest ones that was ever done. Um, but in ma many of the, the data I'm going to talk about now derive not from randomized controlled trials, but from other kinds of studies. And often it's necessary to do other kinds of studies other than randomized controlled trials um, in this area. Now, for instance, when we're working with the general population, it's very difficult to do a randomized controlled trial because you cannot tell people whether their child's going to get early childhood education or not. They have to, they'll choose for themselves. You cannot tell pe pe people they're going to go back to work and use childcare. They'll choose that for themselves. You know, these are factors that you cannot uh, investigate with randomized controlled trials. So they have to use uh, population-based studies. And one of these is the uh, EPI study. Now, the EPI study has changed its name over time. It started out as the effective provision of preschool education project, EPPE, okay? It then morphed as the children moved into primary school into the effective preschool and primary education project, again, EPPE. And now the children in the secondary school, we call it the EPSI project, effective preschool, primary, and secondary education project, because we're not only looking at preschool or, and primary, but we're also looking at secondary school now, okay? And here we see the investigators, Kathy Silver and Pam Sammons based at Oxford, Iram Suraj Blatchford and Brenda Taggart based at the Institute of Education, and myself. And this study started in 1997, and this year we'll be reporting on the children at age 16. I'm going to tell you the results up to age 14, because those are public knowledge. Uh, the age 16 results will be available probably around the end of the year. Okay, now what we did is that when the children were age three, we recruited 3,000 children to the study from a random selection of every kind of preschool center that existed in England at the time of the study. And we, we picked 141 centers, which were either nursery classes, play groups, private day nurseries, nursery schools, local authority day nurseries, or integrated children's centers. And then and there were 141 of those centers 
And then we had another group of children who didn't go to any center at all, but uh, uh, we followed those through as a comparison group. And we've been following those children through fairly intensively from age three through to age 16. And when they were age three, we also interviewed the parents extensively about what ha had happened to the child since birth in terms of the childcare history of the children, any developmental problems, any health problems, and so on. So we really have extensive data on these children from birth through to 16. On the family, the child, and the preschool environment they were in, on the, and the primary school they were in, and the secondary school they were in. And we've been looking at their cognitive, educational, and social development over time. Now, at the start of school, this is what, uh, an essential summary of the findings. We found that those children who had been to a preschool center for one to two years showed this, this month this much developmental advantage. Uh, now, the green is low quality centers, the blue is average centers, and the gray is high quality centers. So, quality matters there. And this is months of developmental advantage up the y-axis here at the start of school. And this is a literacy measure. I could use a numeracy measure or a social outcome and you find similar effects. But some of the children would have had an extra year of, of preschool. And this would be low quality, average quality, and high quality. And again, we see quality matters. But this group are clearly doing better than this group. So duration of the preschool experience also matters. Number of months in preschool and the quality both matter. Now, how do those effects compare with other, back other factors of operating in the lives of these children? Well, girls tend to do better than boys by about 0.2 of a standard deviation. Low birth weight children do worse than average birth weight children. This is the effect of high duration of preschool. This is the effect of high quality of preschool. This is the effect of social class. And here's the biggest effect of all, the home environment. And this effect of the home environment was having a stronger effect than social class and parent education at the start of school. Now, what is this home environment factor? Well, it derives from questions that we asked parents when the children were three years old. We asked them about a wide range of activities happening in the home. In fact, we asked about 14 activities which typically may, may occur with any three-year-old child. But we found that particular activities were related to the child's developmental progress. Things like reading to the child, library visits, painting and drawing in the home, playing with letters, playing with numbers and shapes, learning or singing songs and poems and nursery rhymes. And we would ask the parents uh, questions of this kind. Oh, does anybody at home ever read to the child? And some mums would say, oh, no, don't bother with that. We'll leave it to the school. Others would say, oh, I get round to it every now and again. Some would say, oh, I do it every Saturday because I have some free time on Saturdays. Some would say, I do it every other night. And some would say, I do it every night. And so we'd have a, a, freak, a, a continuum of frequency from not occurring, zero, to seven, occurring very frequently indeed. And we'd measure the frequency of all of these activities and add together the frequency of this total package of activities and call it the home learning environment. And this is the distribution of this measure of the home learning environment. It's almost a perfect normal distribution. We didn't plan it that way, it just came out that way. Uh, and it proved to be a very useful measure in the course of our study. We had a saying at that point, the home learning environment in the early years has a powerful long-term effect. In particular, what parents do is more important than who parents are. We say that because what this, at the start of school, this effect of the home learning environment was actually stronger than the effect of social class, who parents are. You know, what they actually did with the children was more important. Now, as the children started to progress through school, they start to come into a system of national assessments, which are given in reading, writing, mathematics, and uh, science to every child in the country, a standard assessment. And we got the data from these standard assessments for our study children. 
And at age seven, this is what it looked like for literacy measures. The solid line is the preschool group. The dotted line is the no preschool group. And these children on your left are the children from professional families, the ones in the middle are children from skilled families, and the ones at the end are from families uh, with an, in an unskilled occupation. And the gap here, here, and here at all points is more or less the same. So in absolute terms, the benefits of this preschool experience seems to be very similar for all social classes. However, when we look at this measure here, this level of attainment here, level two, this is the expected minimum level of attainment for any seven-year-old. Now, if you're from a professional family, whether you get preschool or not preschool, you're well above that expected minimum level. If you're from a skilled family, with preschool, you're well above that level. You're just above that level with, with, without preschool as well. But for the children from unskilled families, they're above that level with preschool, but below that level on average without preschool, which means that the consequences for the disadvantaged children in unskilled families is much greater than for the skilled or the professional families because these are the children who will be labeled as doing badly at school, will be put into special needs classes, maybe kept down here, and so on. So the consequences are more dramatic for that group. Now, at this point, we were able to combine together uh, quantitative research methods with qualitative research methods. From our quantitative analyses, we were able to identify those early childhood education centers which were more effective than others. And I say more effective in terms of they produced a greater benefit in terms of developmental outcomes for the children, allowing for the home, the home background of the children uh, than might be expected. Whereas other centers might produce as expected results or even below expected results. So we are, we are able to identify effective and ineffective centers. Having selected some of these effective and ineffective centers, we then sent qualitative researchers into those centers who would spend three weeks or so collecting lots of case study material through interviewing the staff, interviewing parents, observing what happened in the centers, and then writing a case study report. But they would do that not knowing which were the effective and which were the ineffective centers. Okay? When they brought the data back to the office, we then told, said, OK, now we can tell you which were the effective and ineffective centers. And then we then looked in their case study notes to see what was it that was happening in these centers which differentiated the effective from the ineffective. And this is what we found. There seemed to be five areas particularly linked to effective preschools. The quality of adult-child interaction, the knowledge and understanding of the curriculum by staff in those centers, in the effective centers, the knowledge of how children learn, child development, if you like, the adult skill in helping children resolve conflicts, and also the adult skill in helping parents to support children's learning at home. Those were the five factors which particularly differentiated the effective from the ineffective centers. And also, in the effective centers, we observed a particular kind of pedagogical interaction. These were adult-child interactions that involved sustained shared thinking and open-ended questioning to extend children's thinking. It's an episode where two or more individuals, typically a member of staff and a, a, an individual child, work together in an intellectual way to solve a problem or clarify a concept or evaluate activities or extend a narrative. And both parties contribute to the thinking. Both the adult and the child contribute in the interchange to build a solution together. Okay? And that kind of interaction primarily only occurred in the effective centers. It didn't occur hardly at all in the ineffective centers. Now, as the children are moving through school, getting older, they're going to be affected not only by what happened to them at birth, the kind of family they come from, the kind of early child care they had, the kind of preschool center they went to, 
they're going to be affected by their primary school and later by their secondary school. So this is the kind of analytic model that we built up. We have child factors, gender, birth weight, ethnicity, family factors, parent education, social class, family size, the home learning environment, as I told you about, the measured at several points in time, three, six, and 10. The preschool, the quality of the preschool in terms of what we observed when we visited those preschools, the duration of preschool experience, whether it was part-time or full-time, um, the primary school that the children attended, and we developed, both for the primary school and the secondary school, we developed measures of the effectiveness of the primary school and secondary school by looking at the data for every child in the country, that's over 600,000 children um, in any one year group, by looking at how much children improved from the beginning of the school to the end of the school in national assessments, controlling for demographic factors. And effective schools would show a bigger improvement, controlling for demographic factors, than ineffective schools. And that would apply both to primary and secondary schools. So we had measures of the effectiveness of the school that they went to. And we could then model uh, these factors in terms of how they influence a child outcome, like literacy, or numeracy, or sociability, or behavior problems, or whatever, uh, at different points in time. And these are the results at age 11 on literacy and numeracy measured by national assessments. And what we see, see here is that family income has an effect size for literacy of about 0.27 of a standard deviation and very similar for numeracy. Mother's education, on the other hand, has a much bigger effect, over, over 0.7 of the standard deviation for literacy and numeracy. That's by far the most strongest effect at age 11, mother's education. Then we have the effect of father's education, roughly half that of mother's education. Okay. Now we know parents are twice as important as fathers. Okay. Or alternatively, you could say, those bloody fathers should do a hell of a lot more with their kids and start to increase their influence. That's another way of looking at this result. Uh, socioeconomic status, other than uh, family edu parent education, things like uh, professional or unskilled or skilled uh, occupation in the family. Then we have the home learning environment, a very big effect, almost as equivalent to the mother's education effect on literacy, and also a very strong effect, but not quite as strong, on numeracy. This is the home learning environment measured when the children were three. And these are results eight years later at the, end of sec at the end of primary school. We also looked at the effects of the uh, uh, home learning environment measured at six and 10, but it was nowhere near as strong as the home learning environment measured at three. Then we have the effect of attending a high quality preschool on literacy, and then again, even a stronger effect of 0.4 on numeracy. Then we have the effect of, a, of the primary school that the child went to, whether an effective or an ineffective primary school, and a, a fairly similar effects on literacy and numeracy to the preschool. So we're seeing several interesting findings there. Firstly, that these preschool effects are still persisting at the end of primary school. Also, another preschool effect, this early home learning environment, is still having very dramatic effects in quite a long, term late, long time later. And look at these effects here for the preschool and the primary school. They're almost identical size. Now the average child in the study went to the preschool for 18 months. They'd been to the primary school for six years. So I leave you to work out for yourselves the relative cost benefit of investing in preschool versus investing in primary school. Uh, that's not to say that primary schools aren't important, but you know, you're getting more bangs for your buck, as it were, from the preschool. Um, now, we were also able to look at interactions between preschool experience and primary school experience, because some children would go to a high-quality preschool, but a low-effective primary school, or a high-effective primary school, or an average primary school, and vice versa. 
So you get various combinations. So these children here all went to preschools which were low on effectiveness. And the yellow is a low effective primary school. The red is the average primary school. And this gray is the highly effective primary school. And we see that the effect of the primary school for this group of children is very strong. This gradient here is very, very steep. So the primary school differences have a big effect on, the on this group of children who went to low effective preschools. Then we went to have the children who went to the average preschool. And again, we see the effect of the primary school is quite important, where the low effective primary school does worse than the average primary school, who does worse than the highly effective primary school. But the gradient here is much less steep. Then we have the children who went to the, the high effective preschools, the top 15%, as it were, of preschools. And, what, and here's the low effective primary, average primary, and high effective primary. And here we see there's virtually no difference. It's as if going to a high effective preschool inoculates you against the effect of poor teaching in the primary school. You learn to learn regardless of the quality of teaching. We also see similar effects with high ability and low ability children in the national data for all the children in the country, where high ability children will do well in schools regardless of the effectiveness of the school, whereas low ability children are dramatically affected by the effectiveness of the primary school they attend. But we're also able to repeat those analyses when the children were age 14. And there, we're able to take into account the, the secondary school effectiveness as well. And the results change a little bit at 14, but not dramatically. Again, we see the effect of family income as it is quite strong. The effect of mother's education is not quite so strong, but still the strong, strongest effect here uh, uh, at age 14. Father's education, again, similar kind of level of effect. And socioeconomic status, again, the home learning environment has become a little bit less dramatic at 14 than it was at 11, but still quite a strong effect. High quality preschool is having a similar effect it did at age 11. The primary school effect is similar for numeracy, but has dropped out for literacy. And the secondary school has, has become important, a very strong effect. We're finding very strong effects for the effectiveness of the, the secondary schools that we have. In fact, the effect, the, the effect of the secondary schools seems to be stronger than the effects we saw for the primary schools. And we think this is because of the differentiation we see in the English education system. Whereas the primary schools tend to be more, more uh, uh, of an equivalent basis. You don't find as dramatic differences between the primary schools as you do between the secondary schools, where you find very dramatic differences between the quality of teaching in secondary schools across the country. So that's probably why those secondary school effects are so, so strong there. OK. But these effects were not just on educational outcomes. Looking at social outcomes, this is the effect of going to a high quality or low quality or average quality preschool on self-regulation when the children were either 11 or 14, very similar results. This is the low quality preschool, average preschool, high quality preschool. And we see that the quality of the preschool the child attended affects their self-regulation measures at 11 and at 14. In pro-social behavior, again, we're finding the effect of the quality of the preschool the child attended had, a, had a, important effects. Remember, all of these effects I'm telling you about are having control for all of the background factors that I talked about earlier. Now, we're also able to look at children's patterns of results over time on a given measure. For example, we had, we had cognitive measures, which are measured by standardized assessments at set points in time. Here's an example. This is three years, at three years of age, reception, which is five years of age, six years of age, seven years of age, 10 years of age, and 11 years of age. And controlling for background factors, we find that children score in various ways and show certain kinds of trajectories over time. And what we found across our 3,000 children is there were six predominant developmental trajectories. That is, most of the children in the sample would fit within 
more or less within one of these trajectory patterns. There would be some individual exceptions to it who wouldn't fit this pattern, but the majority of children would fit one of these six patterns. Uh, now, zero would be average. One would be one standard deviation above the average. So we have one group here, number six, red, who will start off very high, scoring very high, and stay very high throughout the study. Then we have another group, group five, who also start off very high, but then they fall off to be about average. Then we have two groups who start off just about at average at age three. One of these groups, four here, starts to climb and then starts to score consistently highly along here. The other group, however, falls off in time and starts to score consistently lowly. Then we have another group here, group two, who start off scoring quite low, but then climb up to be about average. Then we have another group, quite small, only 8%, who start off very, very low and just stay low throughout. Now, the, those trajectories tell us some interesting messages. First of all, some of those trajectories are quite favorable. Trajectory number six is quite favorable. We'd like our child to be in trajectory number six. We aren't certain. We'd like our child to be in trajectory number four. It starts at average, but it, gets high. it starts to improve over time. Or it maybe starts low and then improves up to average in trajectory number two. So two, four, and six are, would be positive trajectories, favorable trajectories, whereas trajectories number one and three would be unfavorable trajectories. Okay? And if we look at what affects the likelihood of being in a favorable trajectory versus an unfavorable trajectory, what do we find? If you have a high home learning environment, you're much more likely to be in a favorable trajectory. If you have high quality preschool, you're much more likely to be in a favorable trajectory, and so on. So it's, it, it repeats the results I told you about earlier in that respect. But there's another interesting message from these, from these data. Suppose I draw a line at this point in time, which is equivalent to the first year of primary school. OK, I'm drawing a line there. What's happening to the right of that line? Nothing. The groups are staying in all the same relative positions after that point in time. What's happening to the left of that line? All the change. All the significant change in the population of children is occurring in the preschool period. So the lesson here is, if you want to produce change at a population level, you better act in that preschool period, because after that preschool period, the children are, by and large, going to stay in the same relative positions. OK, this act fact is very similar to the message that Fraser Mustard was giving earlier. The first 2,000 days are what's critical, first five years. OK. Now, we've got supporting evidence for these findings. We did a parallel study in Northern Ireland where we only had 850 children, and we were only able to follow them up to 11 years of age. But in those results, which I'm not going to present in detail, but they essentially show the same pattern of results to those in England. And where high-quality preschool improved maths and English results and improved progress in maths over the primary school for those children who had high-quality preschool. And children who attended high-quality preschools were 2.4 times more likely in English and 3.4 times more likely in mathematics to attain the highest grade at age 11 than children without preschool. Imagine that. Take two children, both of them disadvantaged. One of them you don't give any preschool to. The other you give some high-quality preschool. They start off from the same base. The child who gets to high-quality preschool will be more than three times more likely they get a high grade in mathematics at the end of primary school than the child who didn't get the high quality preschool. That's a dramatic effect. You can see these results here. These are the odds ratios uh, up the side here, where we see how, 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 how much a factor increases. So birth weight on literacy, uh, low birth weight children are three times less likely to get uh, a good score than average birth weight children, and, and more than four times less likely uh, for mathematics. Early developmental problems also have a strong effect. Dual versus lone parent. Lone parents were doing worse than dual parent fam families in these academic outcomes. Interesting here, this is a cultural difference. In England, 
the dual versus lone parent distinction had no effect at all once we control for all the other demographic factors. But in Northern Ireland, which has a different cultural context where lone parenthood was more stigmatized, it was still having an effect. Mother having a degree versus no qualifications, a very strong effect on literacy and also on numeracy. Father having a degree, also a very strong effect. Socioeconomic status, a strong effect again. Living in a deprived area in Northern Ireland was having an effect as well, quite separate from these other factors. Then we have the high quality preschool effect here. 2.4 times more likely in literacy and 3.4 times more likely in mathematics to get the high grade. And here we have the home learning environment. Almost six times, children with a high home learning environment were small, almost six times more likely to get high grades in literacy and, three and three, over three times more likely to get a high grade in numeracy. And so we're seeing those effects in Northern Ireland. And another factor which we found were peer group effects. We found that the social mix in the early childhood center affected the outcome. So for example, disadvantaged children show greater benefits when they're in early childhood uh, education and care centers that are socially mixed rather than centers which are, have only disadvantaged children. I think this is quite an important lesson when you're thinking about where to site your early childhood centers. You can put them in the middle of, a, of an area of disadvantage, in which case all the children attending that center are going to be disadvantaged. Alternatively, you can put it on the edge of an area of disadvantage, so you'll get children who are disadvantaged attending that center, but also children who are not disadvantaged attending that center, and therefore you get a so more socially mixed climate in that center, which will be more advantageous to the disadvantaged children. OK, conclusions. We found in our analyses that from age two, all, benefit, all children benefited from early childhood education and care. The quality of early childhood education and care matters. The, these effects of early childhood education and care persist until the teenage years, at least, and we'll, we'll so, shortly see whether they persist uh, till age 16. High quality early childhood education and care can protect a child from the effects of a low effective school. Poor children benefit from a social mix in their early childhood education center. And early home learning environment effects persist into the teenage years. These results over the last 10 years have had quite a number of policy impacts in the UK. As a result of these findings, from 2004, we had a free early childhood education place provided on a part-time basis for every child in the country from three years onwards, from their third birthday onwards. This is being extended down to two years for the 40% most deprived families from this, actually, 2014 onwards. We also found evidence in, in relation to uh, the first year of life, which, le which influenced the extension of maternity leave to 12 months or one year, whereas previously it had been five months. We uh, found that th the government produced a new early years curriculum called the Early Years Foundation Stage, which is based upon some of the EPI findings. We have new training programs for early years staff, which are based upon EPI findings. And we, found, and we have an acceptance in government. Even the current very austere cost-cutting government that we currently have, that early years spending is part of government responsibilities. Also, in the EPI study, we had various kinds of preschool centers that we looked at. And one of these types of centers were, what were pioneers at that time and were called integrated children's centers. We found that the results for these integrated children's centers overall were better than for any other type of preschool center. And when the government started to roll out the Sure Start program for disadvantaged children, they found that the early results from the Sure Start program were rather disappointing. So, and then simultaneously, we started to, to, to the government receiving that finding, we were able to tell them that the 
uh, integrated children's centers were having very good effects. So the Minister for Children decided, okay, from now on, we're going to give up on the laissez-faire approach to Sure Start programs and make all Sure Start programs become children's centers, which happened from 2006 onwards, um, where they had a, a more specified program of parent support, early child care, health support, and early childhood education. Now, what I've told you today shows that parenting and home factors have twice the effect of preschool or school factors on children's outcomes, like the home learning environment, parent education, and so on. I've tw well, I'm tw roughly twice the effect of the preschool factors and the school factors. However, what should we do as policymakers? Should we think, ah, parenting is having much of a stronger effect, therefore we target parenting. What are you gonna do about parenting? Your policy lever over parenting is a bit like this straw. Crumb, you, know, you just get nowhere. On the other hand, the policy lever you have over early childhood education and care is like a steel bar. You can really do something about that. So this is one of the dilemmas that you were faced with in this area. We have clear policy levers which can influence preschool and school if we have the political will and resources to do so, whereas policy levers on parenting are much more limited and probably require more subtle uh, uh, influences. 